professor. And what is your motivation to uh, study on philosophy of perception? Um, I don't know, that's my job. That's what I get paid to do. So that's my main motivation. But so, so I think that philosophy of perception is a really important discipline and it's a, it's a bit of a new discipline. A lot of, not a lot of people uh, have been interested in it when maybe 50 years ago, there was not such a big area of philosophy. Um, I think um, philosophy of perception is absolutely crucial in, in many ways. And um, um, I'm gonna give you two reasons why, why it's, it's really important. First of all, so it's supposed to be part of philosophy of mind. So philosophy of mind is trying to understand how the mind works. And philosophy of mind has various, various sub-disciplines, philosophy of perception, which is about how perception works, philosophy of action, which is about how, you know, how, we, how we perform actions and so on. The good thing about philosophy of perception as part of the philosophy of the mind is that there's just a huge amount of empirical results about how perception works. And a, a very good trend within philosophy of mind is to try to pay attention to the empirical sciences. So philosophy of mind is about how the mind works, but so is psychology and so is neuroscience, right? So um, one, one thing that I, uh, that I think every philosopher um, should ask themselves is why, why, why does the world need us philosophers? Why do we need to do philosophy? And, and if you're doing philosophy of, uh, of mind, why do we need philosophy of mind? What, what, what extra thing can you understand about philosophy sorry, about the mind by doing philosophy of mind that you can't understand on the basis of psychology or neuroscience. And, uh, and, and I think part of what, um, part of the answer is that there should be some kind of interaction between the empirical results and the philosophical theories about the mind. Uh, if there isn't, then there's really a very little justification of doing philosophy of mind that's kind of cut off from psychology and neuroscience. But if you're not cut off from philosophy and neuroscience, if you are paying attention to those results, then I think it's a really good idea to start with a part of the mind where there's just a lot of really solid and good empirical results. And there's the, of all the parts of the human mind that we understand from the empirical sciences, so from psychology and neuroscience, perception is the most developed. So it's really, you get a lot of uh, good interaction between empirical, uh, empirical sciences and philosophy there. Right? So that's about some, uh, why, why perception, why philosophy of perception and not other parts of philosophy of mind. But also, just to go back to the aesthetic stuff, I mean, I understand that you're tr trying to transition to perception, but uh, to, to connect this back to the aesthetics part, we, I think we all, we, we all agree that aesthetics just, is just really important of human life. But in order to understand, uh, for example, aesthetic experiences or the experience of beauty or uh, how, you know, different artworks are experienced differently, these are questions about perception. These are questions about experiences and the, and the philosophical discipline that, that, uh, that is about experiences is philosophy of perception. So I think that philosophy of perception is not just in a good, good place in terms of uh, how it's, uh, it's nicely hooked up to the empirical sciences, but it also has really important implications for other branches of uh, philosophy and of human endeavor like aesthetic. Thank you. Um, Professor, um, world of object notions they are exist as we perceive them and is it possible to perceive these uh, things objectively? Ooh, uh, so objectivity is a really notoriously wild term. Um, so I mean in some sense yes, so I'm looking at, uh, at my laptop and uh, that's what I'm looking at. There's no illusion. You know, I'm not just looking at the illusion of, or I'm not hallucinating my laptop. But, and, and again, this is something that came up before. I think the way we see certain things is very much influenced by our background assumptions, expectations, beliefs, desires. Um, you see a cup of water very differently if you're very thirsty uh, or if you want to water your plants. Um, and, uh, and depending on your expectations, uh, you will see someone like your friend very differently if you expect them to be really angry at you or being very affectionate towards you, just literally going to have very different experience. So, so, in, so of, of course, there's just something that you see out there and then you're seeing it and there's an object that's independent from, from, from you and, and you have some kind of uh, experience of that object. 
but this experience will also so it's going to obviously depend on this mind independent object but it will also depend on your various uh, mental factors about your background mood about your uh, expectations and so on so this is kind of a half answer but i would say that yeah the perception is objective but it's also influenced by a lot of things that are going on in your, in your mind thank you so is it possible for words which shape our thoughts to be really deconstructed as the language itself is as cumulative as it being affected by environment society and culture how possible is it to deconstruct these words with other words Uh, okay, so this is our language. So the question is, the language shapes our thought? Yeah, our perception. Perception. So, so this is a big question going, going back, back decades and centuries. But, uh, but, but again, this is, this is a bit where, um, where the empirical sciences can really help, uh, help philosophy. And this is actually something, so just a paper that I, I, I am in the process of writing. I just did it like an hour ago when, when before we started um, this, uh, this Zoom call. So there's a lot of really cool results about how uh, words influence our perception. So, um, and this is called priming in, in, in psychology literature. So if you see the word, uh, I don't know, duck, and then you look at this a scene, then you're going to be quicker finding ducks, uh, quicker recognizing ducks and so on. Um, and and uh, what, what is interesting and what, what, what really fascinates me at the moment is that this does not seem to, this happens so quickly in the mind, so it's, a, it's, it's less than 100 milliseconds. So less than 100 milliseconds means that it's less than uh, a tenth of a second. Um, it's, it's extremely little time uh, in, uh, in terms of the, the perceptual processing. It happens this quickly that a word influences your perceptual processing. So the, the classic model in, in philosophy of mind and also in kind of 80s computation, classic cognitive science, is that you hear a word that somehow that gets, gets processed all the way up, and then it kind of it, uh, lights up this concept of a duck and that kind of trickles down on the, and, and influences the perceptual system. But it turns out that that's just, we just don't have enough time to do that. I mean, that's not the way the timing works. So because of the timing, it seems like the, uh, you hear the word and that this just laterally influences your perceptual system. So it's not just that words uh, influence your perception. It influence, they influence your perception almost without any, not, not by means of uh, much kind of complicated semantic processing. It's, uh, it, it, it seems like it's a much more, these two things, you know, the language and perception, they kind of intertwine at a much more, much lower, a much earlier level than, than the thought. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think there is an association between the aesthetics and the beauty. And what is your opinion about this? Is it possible for ugly to be aesthetic? And is the beauty of an object what makes it aesthetic or just a proportion and the balance enough for it? Good, so, uh, so I agree with you. Yeah, beauty is not really what aesthetics is about. Uh, what, um, the second part of your question I, I find really interesting because you talk about proportion and what? Proportion and, and balance. 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 So proportion and balance, they are kind of examples of what is sometimes called aesthetic properties. And the idea is that Proportion and balance are the kind of thing that kind of constitutes beauty or a kind of lower level uh, um, properties of, of beauty. So I don't even I don't even think that aesthetics is all about aesthetic properties or all about properties like uh, like balanced and uh, what was the other thing that you said? Balanced and just, um, I mean, just proportion. Yeah, um, just proportion and balance for it. Yeah. So first of all, I mean, something, you can have a, a strong aesthetic reaction to something that is not, uh, not at all balanced and not at all having a, the, the kind of the just proportion. And in many, um, you know, in many very old and respectable artworks, balance was not a thing that people were trying to achieve. They were trying to, to, to they were going against balance. So in Baroque painting, they didn't want balance. Uh, they wanted, uh, wanted some kind of the imbalance uh, experience. So I, I think that the, uh, 
it's not just the, the connection between aesthetics and beauty is problematic. The, the connection between aesthetic and, and things like being balanced or having the right just proportion is also somewhat problematic. Um, and in, in, the, in exactly the, and the way that, uh, that I was trying to explain earlier that, uh, you know, that might explain some of our aesthetic engagement that we're, you know, what we're interested in is whether it's balanced or not, but not all of them. And if you look at, you know, if you look at the contemporary art scene, it's very few works that are really interesting because they're balanced or beautiful or have or you know, bad proportion. Uh, so, so you're gonna just miss out on a lot of things if you keep fixated on beauty or balance. Thank you, Professor. Um, what do you think, uh, what mental status or processes mediate between perception and action? Yeah, so, um, so I wrote a book about this um, seven years ago. It's called Between Perception and Action. And, um, and in, in, um, in, a, in a similar vein that I, I explained before, I think that perception is really important here. So the idea is this, you, um, you see something, I don't know, you see your, your laptop's camera and then you touch it. Um, what, what are the mental processes that are required here? And the classic, in a classic picture, you kind of bring in the whole arsenal of everything that, uh, that happens in the mind. So you have a perceptual state because of that you form a belief that this is where the camera is. You have a desire to touch the camera. You form an intention to touch the camera. Then you touch the camera. So I think that that is, exact, that is the way that some of our actions work, like really complicated actions, but most of our actions, they don't work that way. Most of our actions, you just have a uh, perceptual input and then you form this kind of action guiding representations that I call pragmatic representations and that guides you to do it and that's it you don't you don't need anything else you don't need a belief you don't need a desire you you just need you, you just need this kind of one special kind of rep representation that I call pragmatic representation and that's the uh that's the way most of our actions are um um, work. So I've been, I don't know, I've been messing my, my hair because I just washed it. I did not, I did not once had a belief or a desire about messing with my hair. I just, uh, I just did it because of, because of the, but if this is goal directed action. I was knowing exactly where I'm, where I'm putting my hand and so on. Uh, but I, uh, this is a bona fide actions that are perceptually guided actions, but they're not mediated by all these very complicated mental states. So that's the phenomenon that I was trying to capture in, in the book. This kind of, uh, simpler actions that really make up much of our um, daily life, how they, uh, how they are triggered by perception. Okay, why not hold that the perceptual state remains unchanged while the relationship between and the states and process involved in motor planning and execution of that? Say this again, why, why not think that the perception remains the same when Perceptual what? state remains unchanged while the relationship between between it and the state and process involved in um, motor planning and execution of that. Um, why not think that the perceptual state remains the same and, uh, when you're performing an action? Or is this, is this written down somewhere? Yeah. Yeah, that's the question. Um, Oh, 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 I see. So wh why not think that the perceptual state is the same regardless of what action? So is it about how you're performing two different actions and then the perceptual state is different when you do this? Um, is that a question? So let me, let me just ask the next one. I think that's an inter interesting question. I'm not yeah, sure yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So is the question about the, the, the glass of water, right? So, so you have a, a glass of water and then in one scenario, you're thirsty, so you don't drink it. And the other scenario, you are, you're not thirsty but you want to uh, water your plant or you're really angry at someone and you just want to throw the water in their face. So I, I and I want to say that the perceptual state is going to be different and part of the reason why it's going to be different is that you're going to focus on very different properties of this glass of water. So if you want to drink it then what you're going to focus on is uh, you know what's inside whether this is water from that you you know, from tap water or I don't know how, how much. And you're going to, even, even the way you're going to approach it with, the kind of the grip size that you're going to approach it with and, and the movement that, you, that you're going to uh, want to perform with it is going to be very different. 
so um, the, you're going to attend to different features of this. Uh, so here's another example that I used somewhere. Uh, so the phone. So if you, you get you, you're looking at your phone, and depending on what you want to do with it, whether you want to call a cab or what you want to hammer in a nail, you're going to focus on very different features of the phone. If you want to uh, hammer in a nail, that's gonna you're going to focus on some aspect of it. And you're going to attend to certain properties of it. If you're gonna, you call a cab, you're going to attend to to other features of it. And we also know from a millions of uh, empirical studies that attention very much influences uh, your experience. So if you're, if you're attending to different features of the same object, you're going to experience it very differently, which is also, a, this, is, this is probably something that I should have said earlier when we were talking about how we, people experience the same things differently. Part of the reason for that is because they're attending it to it differently. They're attending to different parts of it, different features of it. So the experience is going to be different. Thank you, Professor. 